All right, welcome back to the Campus Press Box podcast number 28. Uh, today, it's me, Mike Wilson, your Pac-12 uh, senior writer, and I am joined by the one and only Michael Weinreb, who is who writes for ESPN, Grantland, uh, Rolling Stone. He's a published author um, with best-selling books. So, uh, Michael, welcome aboard to Campus Press Box. Thanks for having me, Mike. All right. Hey, let's get uh, let's get right into it. We are there's a lot going on in the Pac-12 and you being up in the Bay Area and me being down here in the desert. We kind of have it kind of cornered a little bit in terms of uh, coverage. But let's start with the uh, the issues down at USC. You know, what, what do they do next, Mike? Or Michael, excuse me. Well, I don't really know what they do at this point. I mean, I think they've they've got to, you know, at least stabilize things. And um, it'll be interesting to see what happens at Notre Dame because there's, there's still a lot of talent on that team. And um, it's possible that, you know, with uh, Clay Helton as their interim coach, that they could pull off an upset this weekend and maybe salvage the season in some way. Um, so short term, I think they've just got to figure out some way to stabilize things and um, figure out a way to, to maximize the talent that they do have, because there is a lot of talent on that roster. Um, and then longer term, the bigger question is, you know, what do they do? Do they try to bring in a, a you know, a big name coach? Do they try to do the whole USC family thing as they've done in the past and sort of try to replicate the Pete Carroll era? Or um, do they just go in a completely different offbeat direction? You know, that the Chip Kelly thing has been mentioned quite a bit. I think that's a pretty long shot at this point. But, um, you know, do they just try to use their leverage and the money that they have and the, and the kind of the name recognition that they have to just get the biggest name that they can? It'll be interesting to see what direction they want to go in at this point and how they're going to sort of uh, try to right the ship because it's, it's a mess down there. Oh, it's a yeah. I mean, it's an absolute mess. Uh, and the the interesting thing is, I mean, you know, when coaches get fired or coaches leave, they always talk about, uh, you know, is the cupboard bare in terms of talent? Wh- whatever. I don't care what coach walks in there. That cupboard is not bare in the least. And like you said, I mean, they uh, they got all sorts of talent. Uh, and plus, once again, I mean, we also have to remember, I think, it's USC. I mean, they, that's a national brand. I mean, they can, yeah. I mean, they can go anywhere and, and dip their pole in the lake and, and fish out whatever they want to get. Right. Yeah. I mean, and you look at it, you know, you look at what Michigan's doing this year and the way that they've just turned things around on a dime. And that's, you know, that's a rare example of things, but if you get a guy like that at USC, if you get an urban Meyer or a Jim Harbaugh, to come to USC, a guy who can who can turn a program around on a dime like that. There's no reason why USC shouldn't be able to win the Pac-12, maybe even next season. You know, it's like it's like they're just kind of always going to be there. They're always going to get some of the best talent in California and in the West. Um, the name recognition is going to be there. It's not like the Carroll era is that far removed at this point. So they, I think they just need to find a guy who, who knows how to coach, and they haven't had that with the last couple. Yeah, I mean, I think the the general thought may be, and you can maybe speak to this as well. Do they do they need to go outside of the Pete Carroll coaching tree? Uh, you know, my belief is they probably should. I mean, you know, the last two guys they've had in there didn't exactly work out the way they wanted. Um, what are your thoughts with that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a possibility that they could do that. If there's a guy in the – I don't know the entire Carroll coaching tree, so there are probably some pretty talented guys in there that they that they can get. But, um, I mean, I do think that at this point they might as well just go for the for the, for the guy that they think is going to be best for them. And it's, if it's a big name, do it. If it's not a big name, don't do it. I mean, I think there's a chance that, uh, you know, Clay Helton might be able to turn this thing around a little bit. And maybe if he does – Maybe you take a shot on him. I don't know. Um, there's just so many directions that they could go in at this point that it's going to yeah. be interesting to see what what they do. Um, because, you know, you could also just get a really good young coach who's, who's on an upward trajectory. And, you know, once he lands at USC, he'll be able to use all those resources in a, in a way to, to kind of leverage all that stuff. Um, you know, it's funny. I thought people were kind of 
being a little bit harsh on Sarkeesian going into this year, and I think a lot of his personal stuff obviously had to do with what was going on there. But, um, I mean, they weren't that far from turning things around anyway, you know? So I think it's, it's, it's not like they're that far away. You just got to find the right guy to make things click there. Yeah. And, you know, one of the, one of the names, and, and you mentioned Chip Kelly. Yeah, I'm with you. I don't think Chip's a possibility. No, I, mean, I think just, that's ridiculous. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think that's a possibility. I mean, he just signed a contract, you know, a couple of years ago worth $35 million. I don't think the GM and the, <laughs> yeah. and the owner are going are to let him just – just go and be on the hook for, you know, all that money or just waste all that money. But one of the names, what do you think about this, Michael, Brian Kelly? I mean, that's an interesting thought. I don't know if he'd want to do it. I don't know if that would be a step up for him or not. Maybe it would be a slight step up, but um, maybe more of a lateral move. Yeah. I think it probably would be more of a lateral move at this point. I mean, Notre Dame, you know, they're not going to, they're probably not going to make the playoff this year in large part because of the injuries they had, but um, this is definitely the best team that they've had. They might make a, you know, make a, a BCS bowl or whatever you call them these days. Um, yeah, and, exactly. And then, um, you know, and then I think uh, he's going to, you know, he could stay and keep building that program. It is true, like a Notre Dame, that, that it's not a job that you can stay at for that long. So I feel like maybe he's only got a few, few more years there, but he also might want to, he might be a guy who wants to take a shot at the NFL. You know, he might be a guy who, um, I don't know, that there's a lot of different possibilities for him. So it would surprise me if he, if he made that move. But um, I guess more surprising things have happened than that. Yeah, exactly. Now, here's what do you think about this name? And this is a name that I heard. I can't remember if I heard it through um, ESPN or if I just heard it, you know, saw it on, the, on my Twitter scroll, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, John Harbaugh. Well, that's interesting. I mean, you know, a lot of guys don't make those moves downward from the NFL to college football. I guess the Ravens are what, like one and four this year. But it's, hard to, like that, it's yeah. hard to imagine that even if they went three and 13, that they would fire a coach who won, won a Super Bowl for them. And then I guess it would be a question of whether John Harbaugh is dissatisfied there or, or unhappy there. Um you know, that's a, that's a rare situation. What happened with his brother, obviously, is a pretty rare situation where, you know, he just didn't get along with management with the 49ers, and that was pretty much the reason that he left. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, you know, he wouldn't – he'd still be in San Francisco if there wasn't that much friction with management. You know, it wasn't like he was, like, heeding the call of his, of his alma mater completely. It was like there was there was problems there, you know. So I don't, yeah. know, what the, I don't know what the internal situation is with John Arbaugh. And I don't know. I mean, how much um, – USC is a huge name, obviously. It's a huge program, but how much are they are they going to be able to lure somebody like that? How much you know cachet do they have at this point? Um, you know, that's that's the interesting situation there. Uh, the Chip Kelly stuff is is interesting because um, I think a lot of it is just, um, and I, I don't mean to you know denigrate the NFL, but I just feel like there's such condescension toward his system and toward the way he coaches at this point what are the, the eagles are what two and three at this point i mean it's not like they're completely out of the playoffs even you yeah, know they're they're not, can, they're, they can yeah. turn it around and still make the playoffs but it's just there's this sense that like people think well it's a college system it's never going to work you know um and so all of a sudden then his name gets thrown into these into these college jobs but especially the usc job would be strange because of his background in oregon and everything else um so i mean i don't know i don't know if usc uh are they going to have to back up the uh, the money truck? Well, that's the question. Do they want to do that? Do they want to back up the money truck and try to get one of these guys with a big name? Or do they want to try to find somebody who's under the radar? Um, or, like I said, if Helton turns things around, who knows? Um, so, you know, I don't think they need to, to back up the money truck necessarily. I mean, there aren't a lot of guys like Harbaugh and Urban Meyer out there, obviously. Yeah, but, exactly. But there yeah. might be a guy out there who. What about? You know, let me throw this name out at you, Kevin Sumlin, down at Texas A and M. I mean, yeah, that's he's he's a great coach. I think he um, has definitely turned A and M around. But he's turned down other jobs too. You know, he's mm-hmm. turned down NFL jobs, I believe. Um, I know he's turned down other college jobs. He turned um, down SC the first time. 
Yeah. So, I mean, who knows? Maybe they could throw a bunch of money at him to get him to come there. But he's in a pretty good situation there right now anyway. I mean, he's he and TCU are basically owning the state of Texas at this point. And, you know, you're an SEC school based in Texas. Your recruiting yeah. base is pretty strong. Not that USC's recruiting base isn't strong either. But, again, I wonder if that's a lateral move for him at this point too, you know? So it's, I, it's, it's an interesting – thought this is one of those jobs i guess where you can throw out any name and be like well that's an interesting possibility maybe that'll happen you know yeah, exactly because yeah. maybe somebody there might be somebody out there who we're not even thinking of who's a high profile name who might be like well sure i'll go to usc or maybe i'm not happy in my current situation and i i wouldn't mind going to use when I mean, you look at all the weird stuff that happened in the off season last year you know with uh with mike riley leaving you yeah. know and and uh and you know, a couple of years ago when Chris Peterson left Boise to go to Washington, nobody saw that one coming, you know? So it's like, you never know when these guys are just going to kind of get restless in their own situation and just feel like it's time to move somewhere else. So I guess that's what USC's challenge would be if they want to go outside is to find that guy who's restless enough that, that he's uh, looking to take that step up. Well, let's, Speaking of restless, there is a Pac-12 coach that there are rumors and have been rumors for about a year or two about maybe him being restless and wanting to move on to a you know a somewhat bigger gig than what he's currently in, and that's Kyle Winningham at mm-hmm. Utah. Even though he has, I mean, he has that train rolling right now uh, in Salt Lake, but. but there, there have been whispers and rumors that him and the administration are kind of button heads, you know, over over money and facilities and, and, and just a myriad of different things. What, what would you think about Whittingham going to L.A.? I mean, that would be interesting. You know, he's, he's done a decent job there. Uh, and certainly he's doing a very good job this year. I guess it's a question of um, recruiting and um, – you know, that would be a step up for him in terms of a job and just in terms of expectations. You know, Utah, you can go, what, eight, four, nine, and three, you know, something like yeah, that. And, and, and not it's, ruffle it's, really any colors. And it's, yeah. it's a pretty good year, you know, and if you have a really good year every three or four years, you're in good shape. USC is one of those jobs now where the, the expectations are just high every year. And so it would be a question of whether he wanted to do that or whether he, he's, you know, now by winning, whether he's got some leverage and some momentum at Utah, and maybe he can utilize an offer at USC to, to get what he wants at Utah and maybe just stay there for the rest of his career. Yeah. I mean, if I'm Utah, you find any way possible to make that guy happy. Sure. Uh, I, I mean, mean, if there's a struggle between him and the athletic director at this point, he's going to win that struggle if they keep winning football games, you know? So it's like he can kind of write his own ticket at this point. And I guess it's a question of whether – he's the kind of guy who, who would want to stay at Utah. I mean, he's a pretty low key guy. So, you know, the USC job is not a low key job. That's the other thing, you know, so that's why like, uh, you know, Chris Peterson, they, they sort of figured he wasn't the right fit a couple of years ago. Um, yeah. because you gotta, I mean, you're, you're front and center in that job. You gotta, you gotta be media savvy. You gotta be, um, media friendly. That's what, that's what Carol did so well. So, you know, they've got to find somebody who's going to be able to fit that profile too. Yeah, uh, you know, and then the other, the the last one I'll bring up is Jim Mora, <laughs> crosstown rival at UCLA. I just don't that, that to me that's just one of those. Let's just throw a dart on the board. Yeah, uh, talk you know, about uh, deal. yeah, talk about media friendly guys right there, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, that's like the least media friendly coach in the Pac-12, I think. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, I mean, UCLA has they're kind of underachieving this year at this point again. Um, I think I think Moore is a good coach, but um, they certainly haven't done anything to prove that um, they're kind of a an elite Pac-12 team at this point. They're a very good Pac-12 team, and I think Rosen's going to get better and better as he gets older. But um, I, you know, I don't think there's anything. I, I don't know. I, maybe it's just personally I, Moore kind of rubs me the wrong way, but I just don't think he's. I don't think that's a huge step up for USC in any way. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think so either. And just just from the simple standpoint of you're going to leave UCLA to go to the crosstown rival. Yeah, I mean that's like, that's pretty I mean, weird. Yeah, I mean that that would be that would be extremely weird. And you know, a couple of weeks ago when ASU was out at out at UCLA uh, playing, I you know I was at the game and I was talking with some fans on the way in and stuff, and and the fans love them. 
the the fans love Mora. They, he he's he's to him to them. He's brought the discipline back. He's bringing money back. You know, walking around UCLA, you, you see things being built. So I, you know, I don't. That when I saw that with Mora as a possibility, I'm like, is is this guy high? <laughs> like, yeah, you know, yeah. you throw you know throwing that one out. But I'm I'm guessing they're not quite as excited after losing to, by 21 points to Stanford either. You know, yeah, yeah probably. So. Yeah, that'll probably change their opinion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it, staying with SC here just for a few more minutes, Pat Hayden. Does he, does he, I mean, it's almost like you just say his name and, and just kind of leave it at that. You can't really say anything because it's, you know, it is what it is. But does he need, is he going to long term? Is he there? Is he, is he going to stay? Does he need to be fired? Does it, I mean, I mean, he got what, we, you know, people would call the kiss of death, you know, because the president came out and said, oh, yes, I, I look forward to working many years with him, you know, and yeah. I kind of looked at that. Like that. Sometimes that's the kiss of death um, when someone's trying to give you, you know, some, you know, some kudos and, and trying to make you feel better about yourself. But what are your feelings with Hayden? Well, the interesting thing about him is like, you know, he was kind of brought in to, to right the ship there. and that, that certainly hasn't happened. Um, but he's also the kind of guy where like his reputation, even through all of this, I feel like his reputation is is strong enough and sterling enough that he can survive it. You know, even if, even if he gets fired at this point, it's not like people are going to remember him in a, in a bad way. Um, it seems like he's kind of a straight shooter who's just made some bad decisions. Um, do they need to have like an outside, uh, like committee, to hire this next coach or like a, or like a playoff they, committee. Yeah. Kind of like a playoff <laughs> committee. I mean, I've heard some people talk about that. Maybe there needs to be like other people uh, making this decision based on what Hayden's last two choices came out to be. I think there probably will be regardless of whether he wants it or not. And that, I mean, maybe that's the reason why they do go outside or make just a completely, um, I don't want to say offbeat, but maybe a little bit offbeat. You know, maybe they, did they just make a different sort of choice at this point? You know, maybe yeah. it's going to be something that they'll that the uh, you know administration would emphasize. Maybe that's something that Hayden wants to try. Maybe he figures, well, if I get one more shot at this, I'm going to go with a guy who has no ties to USC or nothing to do with USC, and we'll, we'll see how that goes. And then I'll, I'll sort of live or die on that. Yeah, I mean, I I was. Not surprised that he didn't step down. I wasn't surprised uh, that, you know, all these people wanted him fired. But, I mean, the moment that he went from the press box down to the field, you know, to defend his coach last year at Stanford, I'm like, right there, buddy, you just hitched, you just hitched your wagon to Sarkeesian. And when Sarkeesian went down, I'm like, okay, if he, if he doesn't survive, I understand it. And if he does survive, okay, I get it as well but man i i there's a there is a part of me that is just a little surprised that he has stayed around uh, yeah this is just, such a this is such a bizarre situation i mean i i can't even think of anything to liken it to where you have yeah. a high profile coach like this who's essentially bidding to alcoholism while he's on the job i mean i can't think of anything that's happened like that in, in sports in recent years especially in a high profile program like this so, um, I mean, yeah, and I have no idea how much Hayden was blindsided by this. I mean, I think if the, the other the thing that would kill him would probably be if other stuff comes out. You know, there was that LA Times story about all the receipts from what Sarkeesian was at Washington, oh, so and, Washington yeah. and all that. Yeah. yeah, but I think if more stuff like that comes out, then then it would be you know then Hayden would probably have no no shot at this at all. You know, no, no credibility at all. Yeah, exactly. So, hey, let's let's get out of the mess at SC and talk about something that's a little bit more fun to talk about, and that's the Stanford and Cal teams that uh, you pretty much get to watch every weekend up there in the Bay Area. Let's talk about Stanford first. Based yeah. on last night, what do you think? I mean, they look really good. Um, the fact that they're putting up. 56 points, you know, UCLA has a depleted defense, but still, uh, I don't even know. I didn't, I haven't looked it up, but I don't know when the last time Stan was Stanford put up 56 points against anybody. So, um, they definitely seem to have gotten it together 
offensively. Um, and it's what, just, what, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think Shaw has done to right the ship? Well, I think uh, first of all, Northwestern's not bad. They were playing on the road. True. First true. game, first game of the year, playing on the road. I think that just happens with college teams sometimes, where you just play a lousy game. You're sometimes it's your first week. Sometimes it might be your third or fourth week. Um, and I think that's a sign of, of why Shaw is a really good coach is because you have a game like that and then you, you sort of recalibrate things and, and figure out what exactly did go wrong. And, um, and I think he's managed to do that. I think he's managed to do that a bunch of different years, you know, where it was kind of like, okay, well, maybe this is it for Stanford. Maybe this, this run is over. Um, and then he'll just sort of figure out a way to get things together. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't see at this point, um, they, they've got a pretty strong path to the playoff. If anybody from the Pac-12 is going to make the playoff, it might be them. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, uh, th- there's a lot of people starting to pick them and going, all right, this you know, and it was fun. It, maybe it, it was a little unfair for people to go, oh, my God, the season is over, you know, after the Northwestern game. And or or if you call it, you know, like I said, riding the ship, it was after, like you said, it was after week one. And sometimes you just play flat. Yeah. You just you just come out and you just lay an egg. And and Shaw, I mean, let's face it, he's a Stanford guy. He's not stupid. Um, figured out you know, what he, what he needed to do. Uh, and I think one of those things is just, is to get that big burly offensive line, just, just chawing people down. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's the thing I've noticed watching Stanford in the last few weeks is that line's just wearing people down. I mean, that's what they do when they're playing well. They just, they just wear you down. That's the thing that they have the advantage that they have over every other PAC 12 team is that they play a different style that they play a more physical style. And so if it works for them, if they're able to do it well, then you have all these teams coming in to play them or them going to play them. And they have to prepare for a completely different kind of offense and a completely different style, you know, playing Stanford versus playing Washington state. It's like a, it's like night and day or even playing Stanford versus playing Cal, you know? Oh yeah. It's so like every team, you look at every team in, in the North and you know, maybe Oregon state is, going to try to play that way eventually but i feel like stanford's the one team that plays that way right now and um and so they're just hard to prepare for 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 these pac-12 teams to prepare for i think and um if they're doing it well if that if the line is playing you know like like you said they were playing and and if uh you know they have a quarterback who's not going to make a lot of mistakes and obviously defensively they're always really strong too so you know, they can just kind of, they can just kind of wear you down in a way that I don't think any other Pac-12 team can. Yeah. I mean, I, I've always equated, you know, growing up in Oregon and, you know, you, you watch the Rose Bowl and you see the big 10 teams come out for the Rose Bowl. And they're just, they were just these big burly teams that would just want to pound the ball, run the ball. Um, and I just look at Stanford in that same light. They're big, they're strong. They just, they just want to wear you down. Uh, and with these speed teams, like you're saying, it's night and day, you know, <laughs> watching Stanford and like you said, even Cal just across the bay, you know, from them or a Wazoo or, you know, any other, or Oregon, certainly. But um, it is <clears throat> it's just one of those things where it's so, it's so different. And if and, and it's something that you can't practice for. I mean, these these other Pac-12 teams, they don't they're not as big as Stanford. They can't simulate, you know, what's it like to, you know, just to get plowed over, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. After I mean, I think that's I mean, you see where I'm going with that? Yeah, no, I think that's true of a lot of times. So you look at something like somebody like Arkansas in the in the SEC, you know, and if they're doing it well, that's why a lot of people were picking Arkansas in the preseason because they thought that they could kind of play this physical style and it would overpower yeah. SEC and Arkansas it turns out isn't very good. But, you know, I think that's true of the Pac-12. I think um, it's true of, uh, you know, uh, some of the other conferences as well, um, where there's usually like 
one or two teams, you know, somebody like Georgia Tech in the ACC where you got to play an option team, you know. Sure. Um, and, you know, I thought Georgia Tech might be really strong this year too because it looked like they were running the option really well. Um, but it's I like, fell for that too. <laughs> yeah, but then it's like if you if there's there's that's the other that's the drawback of it is that there's not a lot of margin of error, and I think that's what happened to Stanford against Northwestern is like they just didn't have things together at that point, you know. And so that's yeah. that's the danger for them is like if they do go up against one of these you know, uh, high powered offensive teams. And it turns out that they just can't stop them or they get, they get caught in a shootout. Then, then they can be in trouble, but then they win 56, 35 over UCLA. And you start to think, well, maybe they can kind of play in both styles this year. Yeah. They can go like mono and mono, you know, with them a little bit and go, okay, if you're going to score, we can score too. Yeah. You know, exactly. And kind of go with it. And, you know, one of the big reasons why they're scoring is Christian McCaffrey. Good yeah. God. What, what did he have last night? He had like 350 yards of total offense or something like that. And he had 235 or something on the ground, uh, which was, I guess, a new school record. What are your thoughts with, with McCaffrey? Uh, I thought he was going to be good going into the year. I didn't think he was going to be this good, certainly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think a guy like that, it, it catalyzes their entire offense, you know, and I think it, it changes what they can do. Um, they can, you know, do, Plus they got you know, Sanders. Yeah, exactly. But, but I mean, they, uh, I think they scored off the, you know, McCaffrey was running the wildcat at one point, you know? Yeah. Um, so, and they, they, you know, they ran that crazy trick play that ended with the catch of the year, you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. so it's like they, they were just like, oh, well, all right, we got the weapons. We can, we can open things up a little bit. And that's a scary thought because if Stanford's able to, you know, put nine enormous dudes on the offensive line on third and two, and then get a first down and then open it up and, you know, go four wide or run some sort of double reverse pass. Then it's <laughs> exactly. like, what do, you, what do you do to stop them at that point? Yeah, you can't. It, it becomes almost impossible to practice for. Yeah. I mean, there's no way you can simulate, simulate that. So, um, yeah, I, I love McCaffrey. And he's not a big guy. I mean, what is he like? Isn't he only like 5'10", 5'11"-ish? something like that. I mean, he's, he's not a, he's not a big guy, but I'll tell you what, he, he's shifty. He looks shifty to me. Like he'll get in, he'll get in the line and he'll, he'll kind of dance around, but he just pops out of the hole. Yeah. You know, or, yeah. yeah. He's just one of those guys who's just kind of, yeah, just, just always standing up, you know, when you don't expect him to be, or just always kind of getting through a hole that you, you, you didn't expect him to get through. You know, it just seems like he's, he's that guy at this point. Um, Does he and, deserve some Heisman talk? Yeah, maybe a little. I mean, I don't know. I think the the I have a sense that the Heisman race is over at this point. I think it's I think it's four nets. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I, you know, I think there are some other decent players out there, but but especially with the running backs, the kind of year that Fournette is having. Um, yeah, I just, you don't see that. I, I don't think that's gonna unless he really slows down or. God forbid if he gets hurt or something like that, you know. No, I just, do, do you yeah. have a Heisman vote? I do not. No. Do not, yeah. 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 But uh, you know, I my thought after seeing him last night, McCaffrey last night was, okay. I mean, he's not going to win it. I mean, you can talk about it all day long. Maybe put him on the ballot. You know, if he keeps doing what he's doing, sure. You know, put him on the ballot. But I'm with you in terms of, you know, I think it's kind of over. Uh, because of what Fournette's doing down there. Uh, yeah, it's tough. You know, you know, I mean, there are a lot of really good running backs. Like, I mean, Devontae Booker at Utah is a really good running back too, you know. Um, but there's, Paul Perkins. there's – Yeah, there's so many of them that you really have to set yourself apart. And Fournette's that one guy where you're like, this is kind of a once-in-a-generation talent right here, you know. I mean, I mean, McCaffrey's a really good back. Yeah, certainly, you know, if he's – if he keeps playing like this and Stanford keeps playing like this, yeah, I could see him getting invited to the, to New York or being a finalist. But um, I think there are just, there are a lot of really good backs this year. Um, and McCaffrey's one of them, but I think the one guy who stands above everybody is Fournette at this point. Yeah, yeah definitely with Fournette. I mean, you know, and we got to remember with McCaffrey, he's only a sophomore. So, I mean, he's. Yeah. Know, I didn't like, even realize that. I couldn't remember what year he was. Yeah. yeah so he's, so he's going to be around. I mean, I, I, he doesn't seem like the kind of cat that would, you know, like he's going to jet after this year or even next year. He seems like the kind of kid that's going to stay all four years. Yeah. Uh, so that'll be interesting to see how he 
develops too and what happens with them. What do you, th- yeah, like, you know, what about David Shaw? Is he, is he long-term there or is he, you know, is he going to ride this thing out, you know, until he feels, okay, I can capitalize on maybe going to the pros. I kept thinking he was going to bail. I mean, I thought the Niners, I assume probably went after him. Um, and he's stuck there for now. So I guess he's happy with where he is at the moment. Um, I mean, I don't know, maybe if they get to the playoff or maybe if they win a national Bennett. title or something, you know, then things change. But um, it seems like he's definitely had opportunities to, to bail already and, and hasn't. Um, and again, those things can change on a dime, but it seems like they must be treating him pretty well there. The expectations are not out of control at Stanford, you know? So if he keeps them at this level, he can stay there as long as he wants. Yeah, like um, you said, he can write his own ticket. Yeah, and he's a smart guy. There's a lot of interesting stuff happening at Stanford with all the virtual reality things they're doing and, and kind of being on the cutting edge of technology. So it's an interesting job to have. It's it's um, probably an interesting job for, for him to have. And, and, you know, I guess the question is whether he wants to go to the NFL at some point and, and deal with the – different hassles of being an NFL head coach, but it seems like he's, he's okay where he is at this point. He's a Stanford guy, right? I mean, he, he, he went to Stanford. Yeah. I mean, that's why I thought the one thing that would make sense would be for him to go to the 49ers, but maybe he didn't want anything to do with that mess the way it is at this point. Yeah. You know? that, yeah. That is kind of a cluster right now. Yeah. Yep. So to speak now, okay. The other team in the Bay, we got, you know, it's California and by all accounts, they got the, you know, they have the best quarterback in the country with Jared Goff. What are your thoughts with Goff? Uh, I think he's the best. He's great. Yeah. I think he's great. Um, I love watching him. Uh, I know he threw five interceptions against Utah. I think a couple of those weren't his fault. I think that was also his first really big game that he's played in and, you know, he didn't play as well as he has in the other games. Um, but I still think Cal can rebound from this. I think they're they're a they're really fun to watch. They're they're one of the more fun teams in the country. You know, if not. Oh yeah, I, I, I think they, year, You know, I think they have like a, a great three headed monster in terms of golf. And I can't right now the the running back and the receiver are kind of escaping my oh, my memory, but. Alaska, yeah. Yeah, when he's healthy, um, he's really good. And then they have this, you know, the tight end, Anderson, who's very good. And they have a couple of good receivers. And um, I just kind of like the way that Sonny Dykes plays, you know. I like the I like the, the air raid style. I like um, just the way that they spread things out. And and Goff is just like, he's really polished, you know. Like, I know by saying that after a guy throws five interceptions is a weird thing to say. But, um I but just, he is. He is. I mean, he just he's he's got this um, presence about him that you don't see with college quarterbacks. No, very often, I, very often I, at all. That's why he's going to be a number one pick. You know. Oh yeah. Have it's, you seen them live? I have not seen them live yet. Yeah. No, I'm going to try to get to a game at some point. Um, but I, you know, I've interviewed him. I've talked to him. I've talked to Dykes and um, you know, and Tony Franklin a little bit about him. Um, I wrote a preseason feature on golf. Um, and I just, you know, I just think that like the, he's got that thing about him that not a lot of quarterbacks have. So, um, does he have the it thing? Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess he does. Whatever that means. I don't know what that means. That's a weird thing to say. Um, but with him, you can just kind of see it, you know, you can just kind of see that he doesn't get rattled. Um, that even in that game against Utah, you know, they were in it until the end, um, you know, playing on the road, not playing very well. Um, and they, they came down to the last drive anyway, you know. And and I think, you know, Cal's definitely much better this year. But they're still, in terms of sure talent, what, probably in the second tier of the Pac-12 at this point, you know. So I think the fact that they can, if they can win nine games, that's a pretty good year for Cal at, at this point. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. What, you know, Cal is one of those programs where they're up for a little bit and then they're down for a little bit. And then, they, you know, they, they it's, it's kind of like a, a roller coaster a little bit. Why do you think that has been? Is there is there some, 
I don't know, leave over or, you know, leftover stuff from um, Dyke's predecessor. Uh, Maybe. Or, I mean, or, I is mean, it, or is it, the, or is it the great, you know, the GPA requirements and all that kind of stuff to get in? I mean, what, what yeah, do you think? I, think I, mean, part of it. I think people just, frankly, compared to the other Pac-12 schools, people don't care as much about football at Yale, you know, it's Berkeley. There's, it's not, the sports is not a huge emphasis. So yeah. I think you have to work against that a little bit. And, you know, when I talked to Franklin and talked to Dykes, they talked about, you know, how much that academic environment helps them because their guys are grounded and they're not, they don't get big heads and everything, but it can also work the other way where I think, you know, you've got to work pretty hard to drum up interest in the program. You've got to work pretty hard to recruit, um, and to bring guys in, you know, they lucked into because he's a he's a local kid who grew up going to Cal games. So, and he was also kind of a late bloomer, a guy who wasn't recruited that heavily by most teams. Um, so it was like Mike Leach and, you know, the old Cal staff were the ones who were basically going after him. Um, but I think, you know, I think they could, they could generate some momentum if Dykes wants to stay there that's the other question you know he's a, he's a southern guy so i don't know if he wants to go back to the south at some point and uh and you know coach in the sec or something um but i think if they can keep him and keep playing this way and you know utilize the system and maybe get another good quarterback after golf that that they could certainly be a top tier team in, in the north um at least for the next few years yeah no, I, I could see that. I mean, I, I'm with you with, with them. They're fun to watch. Uh, and I, you know, I'm a pass first guy. I'm like, <laughs> I, yeah. I like guys that pass to set up the run, you know, instead of the run to set up the pass kind of thing. And, hey, let's get this going and moving uh, and, and keep the defense on their heels a little bit. So, it, you know, you, you said you talked to Dykes. What, Dykes strikes you as what kind of guy? Um, in terms of just like temperament and things or yeah, temperament, maybe coaching as well. I mean, it just how he just views life. Yeah. I mean, he seems pretty low key, um, pretty, um, pretty intelligent. He, he seems like he's, he's got a plan there, uh, kind of knows what he wants Cal to be and, and, you know, wants to frankly, wants to th throw the ball around a lot. Um, and, and open things up and, and spread things out a little bit. Um, so, you know, I think, I think he knows what he's doing. You know, he's, they've gotten better every year and they're continuing to get better. Their, their defense is better than it's been before. I don't know if it's good enough to, um, you know, that they can go 11 and one or anything, but, um, you know, I think they're definitely, this is the best Cal team since, what Tedford's, you know, kind of those, those really good teams that Tedford had in the, what, the early two thousands or something. Yeah. So uh, back then, yeah. Yeah. So I think, and it seems like, you know, Dykes is kind of a complete outsider to Cal and Tony Franklin is the same way. Um, but it seems like they fit into that culture pretty well. And the administration likes them, you know, you don't have a lot of guys, doesn't seem like you have a lot of guys getting into trouble there and, and, <laughs> The, yeah, the great, South Florida State. Yeah, exactly. Like, the, you know, that's – and that's – it's Cal. Like, they – you know, they've had trouble with that with basketball in the past, you know, and I think that's just something that the administration there is not going to tolerate. So I think if they can keep on the straight and narrow with that and um, just kind of turn themselves into, uh, you know, one of these Pac-12 teams that's interesting to watch and can attract good recruits from the from the state, then, then they can be pretty decent. Yeah. And uh, let me ask you this with Goff. I mean, is he, is he going to be a Heisman finalist? Well, he's going to have to, he's got a, some ground to make up, I think, you know, because when you play on national After TV last week, yeah. and you throw five picks, then people are going to be like, well, this guy's not as good as we thought he was, you know, and yeah. especially the people who watch one game a year, you know, watch one Cal game a year, especially um, <laughs> might, exactly. might not see that, but I don't know. I, I'm not sure they got left. I mean, they, I guess they play Stanford at some point, right? Um, yeah. The, yeah. It's so, late November, probably. so yeah. I mean, that could be a big game. Maybe, maybe he can play well against Stanford. Um, I think they, they, they haven't played Oregon yet. Right. 
So no, they haven't played Oregon yet. And every, everybody's beaten up on Oregon, so maybe he can beat up on Oregon a little bit, you know. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. I mean, he's he's still got a shot. I, I think he's I think he's the best quarterback in the country, regardless of whether he's a Heisman finalist or not. Um, and it'll just be interesting to see uh, how much attention he gets because that's you know when you play at Cal, it's not always easy to get that much attention. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would absolutely agree with that. And, you know, you brought up Oregon, <laughs> you know, everybody kind of beating up on Oregon right now is, is Helfrich in trouble? I hope he's not. Cause I think he's a decent guy. And I think that, you know, he took them to the playoff last year to the national championship game last year. Um, yeah. and was pretty good the year before that. So I think he deserves some leeway, but you know, as you know, I mean, I think there's so much hand wringing with that program, when they have a year like this where it's like, well, this is this it, is it over? You know, is this, is that run for us completely done? Um, there's so much of the shadow of Chip Kelly still there. Um, Absolutely. Which I don't think is entirely fair to Helfrich. Um, cause I think he's a pretty good coach in his own right, but I think they just, you know, they, they had some, they've had some bad luck this year with Vernon Adams and his injury. And, um, and they just don't have a quarterback, you know? They just got in one of those situations where they just don't have a quarterback. And if you don't have a quarterback in that system, it's hard to run that system. And so I think that's what they've got to remedy. That's the biggest, um, that was the biggest, I guess, mistake that Helfrich made was that, you know, he thought that Adams could be his guy. And, you know, maybe even if Adams is healthy, maybe he's not that guy. And they just didn't have that guy to, to replace Mariota. And it's not like you're going to get another Mariota overnight. But yeah. at yeah. this point, they're Oregon. You know, they should be able to get one of the best. They should be able to get three of the best quarterbacks in the West. You know, they should be recruiting, you know, a couple quarterbacks every year who are potentially elite quarterbacks who can play in that system. Um, and they just, it just seems like they don't have that this year. So that's the thing that he's got to, worry about the most and figure out the most is is um that recruiting and especially recruiting a quarterback at this point yeah i mean i'm with you i mean helfrich is a good guy uh you know he's he's homegrown up there the fans like him they in much better than they like chip chip you know i have a bunch of oregon alumni uh, friends and uh that give money to the program (laughs) and they never they never really spoke that highly of Chip. Now they they liked all the things that he did. He they liked all the winning and all that kind of deal, uh, but they did not like Chip. They love Helfrich. Yeah, no, that's um, what that's what I you know when I've done stuff on Oregon, people tell me that uh, the boosters and the people around the program like Helfrich a lot more. Um, but I think there's also that you know there's such high expectations there now that there's is it out of control ac- expectations. Probably. Yeah, it probably is. But they're throwing so much money into it that it's partly Phil Knight's fault. You know, he's the one who's throwing all this money into it. You know, he's the one who's who's built up those expectations in the first place. So um, that's um, that's what they got to deal with at this point. Um, And I think I think I don't know. I think Helfrich probably deserves a mulligan this year if things are bad again next year then that's that's when it gets to be real that's when it gets yeah that's when it gets turned the heat gets turned up uh on him so let me ask you this if the playoff were to start today who are your four teams uh as i told you earlier i have absolutely (laughs) no idea um so so we're we're think we're talking today just presuming we have no idea what the results down the road are going to be there you that's, go. That's the, that's the hypothetical here? That's the hypothetical, yeah. All right. So, <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> I'm looking at the – I'm literally scrolling through the top 25 here, and I just don't know. I mean, I guess you'd have to – would you would you have to take Ohio State? I guess you'd have to take Ohio State. Um, you don't have to take them. No, I, I don't, do I? I don't, I don't have to do anything. Um yeah. Okay, so I'm going to take an I'll take an SEC team, which I guess would be LSU at this point. Okay, I will take um, Baylor because I like watching them more than I like watching TCU. No other reason at all. Um, 
because because TCU's played better teams at this point, and they probably deserve to be in more. But this is my playoffs. So I'm going to do what I want. Um, <laughs> exactly. And then um, I would probably go with Clemson. Okay. No, I'd probably go with Utah. And then I would probably go with Ohio State. And then Ohio State. Okay. But I don't really have any idea what I'm talking about here, to be honest. You know, like I think there's no way to like, you know, we'll see how good Texas A&M is this weekend. We'll see how good uh, Michigan State and Michigan are this weekend. Um, we'll so we'll so have I, to see how Stanford plays out. Yeah, I mean, Clemson could pull a Clemson at some point. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I guess I would probably say, what, of the five conferences, the, what is it, the ACC probably has the best chance of getting left out at this point. Although Florida State's still undefeated, too. So... Um, but it I mean, there's just like, so much left. I mean, it's insane. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, you could have, well, you could have, probably wouldn't have three Big Ten teams in, but you know, you could have two big, you could have two Big Ten teams in. Um, sure. You could have two Big Twelve teams in. Uh, hmm. You're probably not going to have two Pac-12 teams in, but no, because they eat each other. Yeah, but you could definitely have a Pac-12 team in there yeah. um, but the Pac-12 is in danger I think the Pac-12 there's a chance they might not have anybody in there you know they might eat each other alive and if the SEC does the same thing I think the SEC is going to get the benefit of the doubt just because that's the way it works right that's a, yeah it's just the way it works yeah and it, you know in my thought at the beginning of the year and I didn't really vocalize it too much and but it was just a thought in my head I'm like the way the Pac-12 is you know the way the Pac-12 South is you know I mean they they just like I just said they eat each other and and it's just like who's who's ever left standing at the top of the mountain kind of deal and but the the person standing at the top of the mountain they could have they could have two they might even have three losses who know I mean you know yeah. it could I mean, be insane I mean the one thing the Pac-12 is going for it is there's definitely a sense that it's at least the second best conference in the country at this point you know. Um, Oh, so, yeah. so I don't think anybody doubts that, you know, I think the big 10 is very good at the top, but not very good through the rest of the conference. Um, but the PAC 12, it's like, even Colorado is better than they've been. Um, you know, Oregon state is not terrible. There's nobody terrible in that conference at that point. Like my, honestly, Oregon might be the worst team in the conference at this point, which is kind of weird to say. Um, but you know, I just, I just think that that top to bottom, there probably isn't a better conference. You know, uh, and the only one that, that rivals it would be the SEC. So yeah. Yeah. there might be a little bit of benefit of the doubt there for a team, especially for a one-loss team like if Stanford gets through. You know, I think that's why they would, they would be in pretty good shape. But even, even yeah, if it yeah. gets, yeah. it gets crazy, yeah. and it's like we're getting down to two-loss teams. You know, and Stanford say loses to. I don't know. I don't know who they have left in their schedule. Say they say they lose like a, a one point game to Cal, and Cal winds up you know ten and two. Then I could still see them getting considered also. You know, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's just there's just so many possibilities that it, it, it's even hard to fathom. It may even be hard to fathom at the end of the month still. Like yeah. who, who really is going to be there? Because to me, there's not one. There's not one team that you just go, okay, they're in, yep, or the, or they're the champ. Uh, you know, it just it, there's so much parity to me right now in all of college football um, that picking like you were trying to pick four teams and it was like, you know, I'm not throw darts at the board. And then also, what do you do with Toledo or Houston or Boise State? You know, because um, yeah, all those teams are really good. You know, and Toledo might wind up going 12-0, and 0, and they, they would have beaten a Big 12 team and an SEC team on the road. Uh, Houston's really good. They might go undefeated. Um, Boise has that one loss to, uh, I think it was BYU, but they're just killing people now, you know? So um, any of those teams, you could, you could make an argument for them that this might be the year that you should include, you know, a non-Power 5 team in there too. 
Yeah, no, I mean, if you if you're beating a, a Big 12 team and an SEC team and you're one of the lower, you know, like you said, Toledo. I yeah. Mean, what, I mean, what you got to remember that, I mean, the moniker of the committee is what the best four teams. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so, you know, whatever it takes to get those best four teams, I'm all for. Uh, I mean, I personally, I like to see the the playoff go to eight or twelve, but I mean, it, I mean that that's down the line. But yeah, yeah, right that's now, gonna that's gonna happen eventually. But it's kind of it's you know it's um you want to keep the argument going because that's what that's what I've always written and that kind of drives college football. You you know is that there is controversy no, there's no objective yeah. truth. You know that's what makes it great. So you want to have that notion that like you know people thinking that their team got screwed in some way. Um, because that's kind of what I think what drives college football in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, you'd also, you know, even if they could just, you know, even expand it to six or something and, and be able to get a non power five team in there, like Toledo or Houston or something, it would, it would be, a, a, I think a cool way to go. And I think that that's going to happen eventually. If, uh, yeah. Eventually down the road. Um, Hey, Michael, Tell everybody where they can email you or find you on Twitter and those kinds um, of things. Yeah, it's Michael Weinreb, uh, Michael, and then W E I N R E B. Um, and that's my Twitter handle. Uh, and MichaelWeinreb.com is my website. Uh, I have a book called Season of Saturdays, which is a, sort of a cultural history of college football. Um, and that just came out in paperback in August. So um, that's something to keep you occupied during the college football season if you if you need something else to keep you occupied um and that's that's about it all right well you can find me mike wilson uh campuspressbox.com writing all things uh pack 12 you can find me on twitter at pigskin opinion uh and you can even email me at uh mike.wilson at campuspressbox.com so for michael it's kind of like the mike and mike show today uh for michael weinreb and myself mike wilson we will see you next time